Hi, in this segment I'm going to introduce the machine learning sequence model approach to named entity recognition and other kinds of information extraction tasks. I'm going to say a little bit about the structure of how you approach things and the features that are used for that task. And then in the next segment I'm going to talk about the details of using maximum entropy models as sequence classifiers. So if we're going to use a sequence model for named entity recognition, we need supervised training data. What that means is we have examples of training documents where the words are labeled for what their entity class is. So the steps that we're going to have to go through is first of all collecting a representative set of training documents that contain entities that we're interested in and the context we're interested in them. And then we're going to go through each word and label each token for its entity class. Or if it's not if any entity class, it'll be labeled other, which is normally denoted O. Then on the machine learning classifier side, we're going to design appropriate feature extractors um, for identifying words of the classes. And then we're going to train a sequence classifier whose job is to do the best job possible it can of labeling each token with its entity class or other. And so this is the part we'll talk about um, in the next chunk. Um, when we then want to run the classifier on actual documents to do stuff, that's often referred to as testing, but maybe we should just call it classifying. We then have the train model, so we get a set of testing documents, we have model, and we just run the sequence model in front on each document, and it will be able to tell us the highest probability label for each token. And we use those labels to output recognized entities. This all probably becomes more concrete if I show you an example. Okay, so here is our document, which is a sequence of words. And so the labeling, which is done by hand for the training documents and automatically by the train model at classification time, is putting on each word a label, which is representing either its entity type or it's an other. So in this column, I'm showing what gets called I.O. encoding, which is inside, short for inside, outside. And it's the most obvious and natural thing for, you to, for someone to come up with for doing named entity recognition as sequence labeling. So we're taking Fred and labeling him as a person. We're then taking Showed and labeling it as an other. Then Sue is a person name. Mung is a person name, Huang is part of a person name, and then these next three tokens are all other, other, other. But there's a catch in that labeling scheme, which is actually this is one person's name, and then this is another person's name. And we can't represent that in IO encoding. We can only say that we'll take maximal sequences of entities of the same class and call them the name of an entity. So it recognized two entities here, whereas really there are three. And so there's a technical way to fix that problem, and that's known as IOB encoding. And the way that you do IOB encoding is you're prefixing each class with a B if it's the beginning of an entity of that class, or an I if it's a continuation of an entity of that class. So then we can see here's one person name, here's a second person name, and we know it stops here because we have another B right there, and then we have a third person name which is two tokens long. So the IOB encoding isn't deficient and solves this problem. It comes at a bit of a cost, because if we suppose that we have C entity classes. For IO encoding, you need to have C plus one labels. Whereas for IOB encoding, you have to have two C plus one labels. Um, the plus one's coming from the other, for which you don't need to distinguish the BI even on IOB encoding. 
Well, that seems a fairly small difference, but as we'll see when we look at sequence models, if you have any sequence information, you're raising this to the order of the sequence model. So you're at a minimum squaring this. And so that means that you are ending up with things having a considerably slower runtime with the IOB encoding. And so while in some sense this is clearly the right thing to do since it's not efficient representation and a lot of people actually do do this, I'll reveal a little secret here which is in the Stanford Named Entity Recognizer we actually use IO encoding. And the reasons why we do that is it runs a lot faster and it turns out that the slight limits in the representation aren't really a problem in practice. And there are two reasons that it's not a problem in practice. Um, one is situations like this very, very rarely occur. While you quite often get entities next to each other, they're most commonly entities of different classes. But the IO encoding has no problem if it's a person followed by an organization. Then it can see the boundary perfectly well. You only have a problem when you have two entities of the same class. And that happens pretty rarely. Now it does happen occasionally, but it turns out that in practice, systems trained with IOB encoding very rarely get this right, even though they are capable of representing it. That because of the fact that having more classes worsens the sparseness, and because of the fact it's simply hard to tell where one name ends and the next one begins, what you find is, in practice, um, IOB trained systems given data like this to tag will nearly always tag them as one person name of three tokens, which is exactly the same classification we extract in practice with the IO classification. And so in practice, using this works fine, despite its slight ugliness, and so we use it. Okay, let me now just say a moment about what features we put in to sequence labeling for information extraction or name identity recognition problems. The obvious starting point is we put in features for the words. So we put in a feature for the current word in each class, so that essentially works like a learned dictionary of words in each class. And then we also put in features for the previous and next words, which give us some context features. We know that for things like words after at or to, it might be more likely to be locations. Um, if we have used other kinds of linguistic processing and we know part of speech tags, they'll often also be useful features and we might also throw them in for the current words part of speech tag, the next words part of speech tag, and the previous words part of speech tag. Now all of these features are just looking at the observed data and they could be just done in a straight classifier built for each word. You only have a sequence model when you also put in the label context. And so that's when you're saying that John Smith, if you think that John Smith, if you think that John is a person name, then it's quite likely that the next token is also a person name because person names are commonly more than one token long. And so you can have features that model this label sequence. And it's having features of this type that are definitional for making something a sequence model. But before we get into the details of sequence models, I'd just like to mention a couple of other kinds of features that are back at this level that are a little bit more interesting than just using the words as they are. And these features are really useful for having the models generalize better and work better on rare and unseen words. So one of those kinds of features is character subsequences. So character subsequences of word can be very useful classificatory features. And I'm just going to show a neat example of this that was done by a student of mine, Joseph Smar, years ago. So he was classifying entities as one of these five classes, um, drug, company, movie, place, person. And what he asked was how indicative are particular character subsequences? And here are just a couple of examples from his data. 
So here are some of the words he was trying to classify, just to give you an idea. Well, they weren't only words, actually. They could be um, multi-word sequences like this one here. But now let's ask some questions about particular character subsequences. Suppose you know that the term to be classified has OXA in it. Well, it turns out this X letter is a really strong marker of drug names, right? That's all of the drug names like Xanax and things like that, that people have these kind of um, particular semantic sound patterns that they name drugs after. And in this data, at least, if you saw the letter OXA in a term, 100% of the time it was a drug name. So that's why it's all purple here. So that was a categorical indicator feature. So that's an extreme case, and most of them aren't like that. But there are lots of other good features. Um, here's another very good feature from his data. Um, for these terms, if you saw a colon in the term, that was pretty much a giveaway that it was a movie name. There are only a few exceptions up here. So that one's an almost categorical feature. Here's perhaps a more typical example, but a place where character subsequences are still very useful. So that if a word ends in field, I mean, it could be anything just about. It couldn't be a drug name in this data, but it could be a place. It could be a person, so David Copperfield. It could be the name of a movie, because there's a movie David Copperfield. It could be the name of a company. But because of the semantic origins of this field ending, if it ends in field, it's overwhelmingly a location over two thirds of the time. So ending in field is still a very good indicative feature. And so in this way, character substring features are very useful. Here's one other kind of feature that turns out to be quite complementary to character subsequences. So this is what I call word shape sequences. And it's an idea that was first suggested by Michael Collins, as far as I'm aware. And the idea was that you map words onto equivalence classes, which are a simplified representation that encodes attributes such as something about the length of the word, something about its capitalization, use of numerals, internal punctuation, and things like that. There are very many particular ways that you can do it, but this gives you an example of the general idea of how to do it um, done on biological entities. So precisely in this system, the way it was defined was that any capital letter, A, B, etc., were being mapped to a capital X. Any little Latin letter was being mapped to a little x, any number was being mapped to a little d, and symbols like a hyphen or a colon or a period were being mapped to themselves. And then there was one more trick that was being used here, which was a way of shortening adjacent letters. So the idea was that the beginnings and ends of words are important, but maybe we can pay less attention to stuff in the middle. So how these were um, worked out is the first two letters and the last two letters are being encoded according to this system that I've drawn over here. And so that means if the word is four characters or less, so that's picking up this length idea, you can see its length in the encoding. So if we had another example and something was just XP, that would be in being encoded as XX. But if a word is longer than four characters, you're not encoding everything about the remaining characters. For all the characters in the middle, you're just saying what is the set of these character types that occur. So in this set here, there's a lowercase letter and there's a dash symbol. And then that set is being written out in a canonicalized order, which is always the same. So actually the dash comes before the X and that's giving this form. Um, a lot of details there, a lot of different ways you could imagine doing it. But the important part is that in this way, we're defining this word shape equivalence class for each word. And so these are much denser than the rare individual words, but can be kind of good predictors of their behavior because they're recording important attributes like is there a digit, is it capitalized, is it all caps or having funny capitals at the end of it? And so those can be useful features for classification. 
Okay, so I hope that introduced the problem of sequence models and some of the features we use for NER, and now we'll get back into a bit of the details of building a maximum entropy sequence model.